Welcome, everyone, to the G-Note Podcast. I am your host, Jason Spicy G. Goldman, and I am a Grammy-winning record producer, arranger, and musician. I've been a music professor at USC for over 22 years, and I am most known for writing and producing music for the iconic Michael Buble over the past two decades. This is a podcast for musicians who want advice and strategies on navigating the music industry. If you're not a musician but a music fan, I promise there is plenty in here for you as well. On this pod, we talk all things music. On today's pod, we are talking about how sometimes you got to dive right in head first. Let's go. Okay, before we dive in, like we usually do, right into a topic, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask all of you guys out there who are listening. Are you one of those types of people that are always afraid to take a chance? Do you feel the need to be ultra prepared before taking on anything remotely new? Sounds like a commercial, actually. If you are that type of person, then this episode here is geared directly to you and will hopefully inspire you and help you. I'm going to help make my point today by discussing the first EP that I ever produced. Uh, I produced my first EP in 2009 for a singer-songwriter named Nikki Lang. I was, uh, at the time, I was the director of jazz at the L.A. County High School for the Arts, which is uh, obviously here in Los Angeles. And Nikki was a singer in the jazz choir. I conducted the jazz band at the school, but we would always do shows with the jazz choir. So, you know, both the jazz band and the jazz choir would go on trips together. So we were all kind of uh, close. After one of the shows, I think it was like a winter concert or something. I I got to talking with uh, Nikki's father and he mentioned that she was looking to do uh, an EP of some of her songs. Now, for those of you that don't know, an EP, which stands for Extended Play, is typically four to six songs, um, as opposed to like an LP, Long Play, which is like a full-length album, which could be traditionally 10 to 13 songs. So I told him to send me, you know, maybe a song or two that, you know, she was thinking of doing, even if it's just her singing and playing guitar. So the, so uh, her father sent me the, the demo, like a demo of her singing uh, a song. Um, I think he also sent me a video of one of her shows. And uh, I came home and listened, and I thought her songs had a really good vibe. But it, it was really actually my wife who, con- who convinced me that I should do the EP, as she was a huge fan of her lyrics. She had listened to, she was with me when I was listening to both of the recordings, and she was like, oh my God, I love these lyrics. If you heard one of the earlier episodes, I do mention that, um, again, I never really listened to lyrics until my wife and I were driving to Las Vegas and we talked about it. And she basically was the one that was like, you got to listen to the story of the song. Duh. (laughs) So um, I end up saying, you know, letting her dad know that I was interested. And if I'm being totally honest here, again, I was a brand new producer. I had just started producing in 2008. I think her dad um, trusted me because I was a teacher at the school. Um, I had done a bunch of touring with with Buble and had already written some arrangements on some of Buble's albums, which have already had at the time had gone gold or platinum or something. So it gave me a lot of street cred. Uh, But at that time, the singer songwriter genre, as I mentioned before, was not something I spent a lot of time listening to. So this was going to be a brand new venture into uncharted territory for me. But I knew a lot about music and the process. So I jumped right in or I dived in headfirst as the title of this episode is. (laughs) So the plan was to do a five song EP of Nikki's songs. And while many people probably would be really nervous to do something they've never done before, You know, especially when someone else's money's, you know, someone else is putting the money up for this. I'm pretty strategic in how I attack these sorts of things, you know, so I can minimize my stress level. (laughs) 
So I started with what I knew I could do well, which was the organization portion of it and the music portion. So the first thing I did is I, I created a budget and an estimate for the recording, you know, uh, and I sent it to her father, laid out how much it was going to cost per track, um, how much it was going to cost for the recording studio, the engineer, my fee, the musicians, et cetera. Now, Nikki did not have any of her music written out. So I wrote out all of the music and, and parts, obviously, for each instrument. And while in this style, typically, you don't really need to write the parts out, if you're going to be hiring studio guys, you know, people that don't normally play with the artist, um, then you should, you don't want to spend too much time in the studio explaining what's going on as the studio time can be, you know, quite expensive. So I wrote out all the music. Um, you know, all she did was she would just uh, send me uh, just a voice memo of her playing the guitar and, and singing and I would write down the chords because uh, I don't even think she had the chords written down. So I wrote down the chords and wrote down the parts and, you know, and I arranged the music also, which is, you know, sometimes there'd be stops in the music or, or basically however she played it is how I wrote it out. Then I went and I booked a recording studio. I found at one of the top recording studios here in Los Angeles and I hired musicians that I knew were amazing. However, and this is important, these were guys that I did not know very well. The only one I really knew was the drummer, but even then we did, we didn't really work together a ton. We we'd only I think played together a couple times beforehand and I think once was at a jazz session, a jazz jam session. Um but he's known for being a really good multifaceted drummer uh, both in jazz and 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 pop rock. So the instrumentation was drums, bass, uh electric guitar, acoustic guitar and that would that would be the basic backing track. And we would, uh, we would lay down saxes and cello as well for, I think, one or two of the songs. And those would be overdubs. Now, for those who do not know, overdubs are recordings that happen on top of the basic backing track. So the, the drums, bass, and the guitars lay things down uh, first. And then we do overdubs afterwards on top as it allows for easy fixes. So the saxophone... Uh, and and the cello were laid down after. As a matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about it, we also did keyboards as well. A bunch, we went to one of my, um, uh, it's an old cat that I knew from USC when I was doing my grad there. Um, this cat, Zach Ray, who was incredible. He played with Alanis Morissette. And he, his studio, he had like tons of like vintage uh, electric pianos, Wurlitzers, um, Rhodes. So he, he did a lot of uh, overdubs and adding those parts on top of it uh, afterwards. Uh, and just so everyone knows too, vocals 99% of the time at this point are almost always overdubbed. So after everything's been laid down, then the vocals are usually added. Finally, I hired an engineer because we needed someone to, uh, when we're at the studio, we need someone to kind of make sure everything is running properly and is being recorded properly. So we hired an engineer who was a friend of a friend who, again, I had never worked with, but um, you know, I was just sent a couple of samples of the stuff that he did and it sounded great. And, you know, uh, I ended up contacting him. So everything was worked out. All I needed to do was go into the studio and get great takes of the songs of the five songs. That, and it should be nice and easy, right? Not so much. <laughs> All right. So we get down to the studio and it was locked. The studio was just locked. And mind you, this is a major recording studio. So the first thing that happened is they had put the wrong start time down on the sheet. So that wasn't my fault. Um, and not a good way to start at all. Right. And even though it wasn't my fault, it already makes me look bad and amateurish. We finally get into the studio, uh, at the session, I meet the bass player for the first time, um, who was known for being a fantastic bass player and reader, just a really great bass player. And from the onset, we had technical issues with the recording equipment, which it almost always happens, by the way, but it was a lot more technical issues than usual. I think there was like a couple of channels that were not working on the board. It was, 
it was actually, again, not a great way to start at all. And it was eating up like session time, which again was costing money. I think it was like an over an hour of session time because the, the board was just not right. So once we were finally up and running, we read down about one, maybe two of the songs. We, we just were trying to get a handle as to what we were going to do. And it was going a lot slower than I anticipated. I'm taking my time, you know, trying to make sure that it gets done right. And I'm experimenting, you know, of course, anything that any ideas Nikki had, we would try to implement. Then the bass player says, and this is while we're in the studio and everyone hears it because we're in the control room and everyone's got, you know, headphones on. And he says, we need to get going because I have to leave in an hour. <laughs> so I say, what the f I'm saying, you've got to be f***ing kidding me. And I'm starting to get worked up because, you know, everyone's looking at me. Nikki's father's looking at me. Nikki's looking at me. And I'm just furious, not to mention completely embarrassed. Evidently, the mic is on in the control room, which was super amateur move by the engineer. And so the bassist heard that. And the bassist says, hey, before anyone says anything bad or that we any of us might regret, I can hear you guys. He says, and, and this is me paraphrasing, I'm not staying here all night and I have a gig to go to. So now I'm starting to sweat. So, so many things running through my mind. I remember like a couple of them, the main, the main two, which were, why would he think he was only there for three hours? And why would he say that so everyone could hear it? Then I realized something. I never gave him the end time of the session. I assumed, and obviously this is the problem, that he knew we would be there for as long as it took, but I didn't communicate that to him at all. And I, and I should have told him, or better yet, it should have been put in an email. And not to mention, you know, I don't know why I thought he would be there all day long. You know, I think in my head, maybe I was thinking like I was giving him a day rate, even though it wasn't a very good, you know, it was decent money for a three hour session or something, but definitely not for a full day. So I, I don't know what was going through my head. All I can tell you is that this is, was the scenario going down. Needless to say, I, I get my shit together. I, I calm down a little bit and I go out to the control room or I'm sorry, I go out to the studio and I discuss, I pull the bass player aside. We go outside, obviously, so people can't hear me. And I discuss with the bass player and we sort it out, you know, and I, you know, I don't know if I apologized to him. I, cause I was probably not in the frame of mind to realize that I made the mistake at that point. But I said, look, man, like, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do. And he was like, look, we can bang this music out. It's not very hard. Let's, let's just get to it and get the music cut and, and you should be just fine. Um, and, but I mean, you know, keep in mind, I was still really pissed. You know, he, he could have, he, he made me look like an idiot, not because of the portion that was my fault. That's me making myself look like an idiot, but because he didn't tell me, like pull me aside and, and, and talk to me privately, I just look like an idiot. And an amateur. And that's not what you want to have happen <laughs> at a studio or any time for that matter. So anyways, we end up having like, I think a little over an hour to record the rest of the songs. It was like, you know, it's three more songs, I think. And we end up getting the songs tracked. It was only like two takes each. Usually I like to get in the studio anywhere between three and five takes, if, if possible, of each song. Um, and luckily, again, I definitely had great musicians at the session and that certainly helped a situation like this because we were able to get still some really fantastic music laid down. So we finish up for the night and the next morning I get into the studio early before anyone else, uh, except the assistant engineer. And he shows me the bill and right. Cause I'm the pr producer and it's double what I was told. So I tell him that's not what I was told. So he gets the studio manager on the phone cause uh, she wasn't in at the time. And we go at it cause I was just furious yesterday. You know, the day before was just a mess. And now I was just, I was just livid. 
Uh, she had told me one rate, and she is saying that rate that she told me was actually per day, not for both days, which doubled my studio costs. So at the end of the conversation, you know, we, we had gone back and forth, and I was pretty irate. And normally I'm really calm in these situations, but this is just, you know, especially with the day before. And she says to me on the phone, she says, pack your shit up and get out of my studio. Yes. Mic drop. <laughs> I, again, I, I went into full sweat again. Uh, obviously, I'm doing a lot of sweating in this episode. We were going to cut the lead vocals on this second day, and she wanted me out. And I don't, th- I don't think anything I could have said could have stopped her from that. So r- at that moment, I'm not sure what to do. I have the artist in the studio. I have her dad, again, who financed the project in the control room. And I had to tell them, you know, I have to go back and tell them that we have to get out. So the, the walls are literally closing in on me, you know, b- by the second. So I finally muster up the strength to tell her dad what had happened. And, you know, of course he was a little upset. <laughs> and he said, give me the manager's phone number. So I give him the studio manager's phone number. I mean, how embarrassing is that? It's like having my dad coming in to save me, right? So he ends up having a conversation with the manager. And lo and behold, they end up letting us stay and cut the vocals. Mostly because, you know, he convinced her, you know, this, this is a high school kid. And this was her dream to record. And, you know and blah, blah, blah. And bottom line is it was a sob story and that I screwed up and that's, it is what it is. So we end up finishing tracking that day and we finish up the, as much recording as we can get done in the two days uh, with no more major snags. The engineer was kind of rude most of the time to me, but nothing that I I was told, you know, nothing that was totally out of control. A lot of times engineers can be a little bit snippy sometimes especially when they think they know a lot more than you, which, by the way, he probably did at that time. So, in any event, that we ended up finishing with no other major snags. So here's the moral of the story, folks. <laughs> Get it in writing. Again, even if it's just an email, I, I couldn't go back to my emails and you know, and there was nothing in my emails that told the bass player what the the exact time was. I remember seeing a start time, but I I don't believe I wrote an end time, which is a serious problem. And it's the same thing with the studio. Like we went back and forth via email and she gave a price, but she didn't say whether it was per day or for the two sessions, for the two days. I assumed, and I thought it was for the two days. That was my take. And she thought I knew that it would be per day. So both of us assuming always leads to disaster. So regardless of whether I was right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is I was the producer. It was my fault because I didn't dot my I's and cross my T's. I should never have assumed anything. Uh, And by the way, I have learned my lesson, of course. Super naive, super amateur move, of course. Um, These things need to be written down. But the good out of this uh, is number one, the music really came out and really, really, it was a great first EP. I'm still proud of that EP. When I listen to it, I'm like, wow, this sounds great. Um, so the finished product was excellent. The artist was happy. The, uh, uh, the artist's father was happy, again, who financed it. And what did it take? It took me diving in head first into something I had not done before. Sometimes you got to just throw caution to the wind and you got to go for it. You're never always going to be prepared. It's like when you have kids and you, you want to be as prepared as possible, right? Financially, it, that, that just never works. You just got to just do it and that's it. And then you go with the flow and you learn and you adapt. It's these types of risks and lessons that really help propel you as a, a, an artist and a musician and as a person to get to that highest level. Folks, we have come to the end of today's episode. And for me, it was actually a little bit nerve wracking to tell that story because it does show a lot of vulnerability, you know, and a lot of um, amateur moves that I made in the beginning. Hopefully you can take some of the good things I did and learn from some of these uh, mistakes that I made so that you don't have to make them on your own. If you want to hear the EP that we've been discussing this episode, 
Uh, you can check it out at jasongoldmanmusic.com. When you get there, click on the podcast tab. Then you'll be given a choice as to which streaming service you'd like to listen to it on. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this pod so you can stay up to date with new shows, giveaways, and more importantly, yes, the concerts. Come out and check out my 17-piece big band. We would love to see you at the Vibrato, which is uh, our home here in L.A. You can also follow me on Instagram at SpicyGMusic or check out my website, JasonGoldman.com, to see what projects I'm currently working on and to see when I'll be performing next. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Much love. Peace. Peace.